Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. This is Nick Shalom. Thanks so much for joining us in the next episode of In the Nick of Time. We're going to get started in about uh, 10 minutes. We're going to have two amazing guests today, and we're going to be talking about AI and machine learning. It's going to be uh, interesting to dig into the subject to really see what it takes to succeed at bringing AI capabilities to the rest of the Department of Defense and industry. Stay tuned. We're going to get started in about 10 minutes. In the meantime, if you want to share, you're here with us. Uh, post your name and organization inside of the comment section. And also, if you have questions for the team, make sure you start with the queue and post the question in the comment section as well. Stay tuned. We're going to get started in about uh, 10 minutes.
Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. This is Nick Shalan. Thanks so much for joining this next episode of In the Nick of Time. We're going to get started in about uh, five minutes now. We're going to be talking about uh, AI and machine learning today and how is this applicable and something that can actually be done at scale in an organization like the DoD and also look at, uh, is it really magic or is it something that's uh, require a lot of uh, due diligence and work? So we'll talk about all of these things in the next uh, few minutes. Uh, in the meantime, if you want to share you here, put your name and organization in the comment section below. And we'll get started in about uh, five minutes now.
Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. This is Nick Shalom. Thanks so much for joining this uh, next episode of In the Nick of Time. Uh, we're going to have a great discussion today with two amazing guests uh, to talk about AI and machine learning. And is this actually magical or does this require a lot of work? So we'll we'll take a deep dive to some of these uh, questions, uh, really looking at also uh, how to get this done inside of the Department of Defense. So stay tuned in a few uh, minutes. We're going to be uh, really deep, doing a deep dive uh, on those uh, topics. So if you have questions when it comes to AI and machine learning, uh, make sure you start uh, your question with a Q so we know it's a question in the comment section below. Also, if you want to share you here with us today, uh, do that in the comment section. Just uh, share your name and, and company or title, or whatever you want to share with us and where you're from. We'll be able to hi highlight you on the screen as well. All right. So today, a couple of uh, things before we get started. I wanted to remind everybody to subscribe to uh, the show at uh, in the nick of time TV. It's very important. So we're not uh, dependent on social media websites uh, to get to you guys. So uh, make sure you uh, you do subscribe. We only have uh, about a, a fifth of uh, of the, the people joining the show actually subscribed. So I think it's, it's pretty important. We're not dependent on LinkedIn, uh, particularly with what's going on. Uh, you know, I got banned on LinkedIn, uh, maybe uh, uh, five months ago. And Funny enough, after complaining for five months, I finally got uh, an update from the uh, LinkedIn executive uh, team saying that uh, uh, the ban was uh, wrongful and they removed uh, uh, the post. They put back the posts that were removed. So two, uh, two out of the three posts uh, were restored. Uh, the third one was just me using uh, uh, the word idiot. So you shouldn't call people idiots anyway, so that's okay. They can call me traitor, but I shouldn't call them idiots. So that's fine. All right. So let's take a look at uh, also the news. Uh, if you missed it, uh, yesterday we were on Fox News to talk about uh, TikTok. And so if you uh, if you know people using TikTok, tell them to uninstall the application right now. It's just too much of a national security risk. And if you missed the, uh, uh, the, the time yesterday uh, during the Fox uh, Tucker uh, show, uh, check it out on my LinkedIn as well. Wanted to also uh, let you know that we just finished recording about 40 video segments uh, about uh, digital transformation, DevSecOps, really a, a course that we've been designing for the last six months to really appeal to pretty much everybody. It's not going to be too technical, but it's technical enough to be dangerous. Uh, so we, we're, we're seeing, you know, C-level executives and uh, senior uh, managers, but also uh, developers, designers, managers, uh, marketing people, sales, uh, very interested that uh, the content we're going to be pushing. And so if you're interested to learn more about the new platform, we're going to be launching and invest in yourself uh, with Learn with Nick, uh, which which is the name of the, the new learning platform we're going to be launching. Um, we're going to have certifications. We're going to be partnering with uh, the, the Linux Foundation and many others. Uh, to create pretty amazing uh, content. We're going to have a lot of guests also to come and talk about architecture and cybersecurity, people that you know pretty well. So it's going to be pretty unique and pretty exciting. Uh, so uh, it's going to be also a, a subscription model where you um, you get access to a private community with live events every two weeks with live Q&A with us. So it's going to be pretty fun. Uh, so if you want to learn more about uh, the Learn with Nick platform, and you know we have many companies and CIOs buying you know hundreds of seats uh, for their employees, uh, or if you just want to invest in yourself, and particularly if you're military or, or civilian, we have massive discounts on the course for, for, for you guys. Uh, so reach out to us uh, at the, in the nick of time, uh, dot TV. Subscribe, you're going to be notified when the platform launches in August. All right. So now I wanted to move to two of our guests, and I'm going to introduce them quickly before I bring them on uh, live here. We have two uh, guests from Torch AI, uh, David Kirvin, uh, who is the chief solution officer at Torch AI. Uh, he leads uh, federal growth activities, but he's, he's just a, a pretty amazing guy. First, uh, his background from, from the Marine Corps is pretty exceptional. Uh, he, uh, he managed to uh, uh, submit the Kanjaro just for charity, couldn't even do it in a helicopter, but uh, it's, it's good that way. And uh, he's also uh, completed a solo 100 kilometer, kilometer race. <laughs> I, I can't even imagine what that looks like. I would be dead by the time we even remotely get close to 100 kilometers. But he's done it. Uh, of course, his background before that, we was at uh, Stanford Research Institute, 
uh, where he was responsible for the 350 million uh, bookings for the for the DARPA hard uh, advanced technology solutions. Um, obviously, he was also uh, interestingly enough in the, in the uh, Chimera, I, I believe that's how you pronounce it, uh, which is a Bill Gates uh, portfolio company. So he probably knows a lot of pretty interesting things too uh, on uh, meta material based satellite connectivity solutions. Uh, for the DoD. So Bill Gates is everywhere, as we all know. Um, all right, so that's David. We're going to bring him on the screen in a second. But first, I wanted to introduce also uh, his colleague, who is also at Torch AI. And John Kramer uh, is the CTO, uh, where he sets the technology uh, and uh, he leads research uh, strategy. And, and he has a dedicated, dedicated career um, with uh, creating advanced machine learning solutions. He has implemented uh, these solutions in multiple uh, Fortune 500 like Walmart and Sprint. Uh, before that, uh, he was on a nice sabbatical after selling uh, his company that he founded and operated for over uh, 10 years. He met the CEO of Torch AI and uh, they got along and three days later he was uh, effectively leading the, the technology for Torch AI. That's a pretty cool story right there. Uh, I guess that pull him out of, uh, uh, you know, his, his time off, which is gets boring after a while anyways, right? You're, you're too young to uh, just do nothing forever. So, uh, all right. So let's bring first uh, our two guests on the screen here. Welcome. Good to have you guys. Hey, nice Thanks for having us, Nick. Yeah. I'm so excited because we have not done a real deep dive on AI. You know, everybody talks about AI. AI is magical, fancy, beautiful. Congress is trying to set new um, guidance and, and kind of creating uh, career tracks for, for AI, forgetting about, you know, cloud and forgetting about software and forgetting about everything else that empowers it. And of course, we have the magical black boxes we'll talk about today of AI, so fancy and beautiful. You just push a button, it's, it's magic. It just does everything for you at no vendor lock-in uh, cost whatsoever, right? So we'll, we'll be talking about that. Uh, but first, I always let the guests right give us a little bit of a background. I mean, I did a quick introduction, but I think it's important for people to get to know you a little bit better. So maybe we can start with David, and you can tell us a little bit about, about your journey. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having us here today. Uh, for me, you know, I've always been a, a little bit of a tech nerd, always uh, had an interest in technology, kind of how it affects human life. Uh, first, via the space program when I was younger. Um, I was born when we were still flying Apollo missions and things like that. It was always intriguing. And, uh, and then later uh, in my career in the, in the 2000s, started to get really interested in advanced technology, how robotics and, and AI, quantum and, and different things were going to affect our future. Um, and landed a series of roles uh, dealing with advanced technology uh, and how advanced technology really affects national security, which is really where my interest is today. So uh, here I am, and uh, and excited to talk about AI today. Yeah, and one one day you're gonna have to tell me how you managed to do all the stuff you're doing in terms of exercising and climbing stuff and running, walking. <laughs> I don't even know how hundred kilometers is like something I would need to do in in a car and probably have a stop on the way. So you know you're gonna have to tell me how that works, <laughs> okay? But then let's go to John for a minute and and let John give us a little bit of uh, his uh, background as well. Yeah, thanks, Nick. So I just so you know, I hate going after David. He's like the prime show pony, right? With like this incredible story. And I've just kind of sat in my basement and uh, like made software my whole life. So, uh, you know, like David, a, a lifetime um, technology uh, kind of apologist, right? I don't think I've ever really um, strived to kind of uh, do things in the status quo at every kind of stop I've made in my career. It's all been about advanced technologies, algorithmic, um, you know, kind of proclivities and things like that. And so, um, yeah, you know, like I said in my bio, I, I wasn't even really uh, looking for any kind of job. Um, and then I, you know, got hooked up on a kind of a funny story uh, here at Torch, and I've been here ever since. So, um, it's been a ride and I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to talking to you guys today. This is going to be great. Yeah, no, that's quite the, the story. And of course, uh, you know, it's always great to, to have an exit, but at some point it also gets pretty boring. Right. So I think, uh, it's pretty good that you found, uh, the next calling, you know, it, it's interesting because for me, after leaving DOD, um, you know, it, it was kind of the most rewarding and also the most frustrating, um, work in my life, you know, and, and so you go back to the commercial side. And you realize that uh, nothing is as exciting or meaningful 
as the work we were used to do in DOD, you know, so it's a little bit uh, a struggle. So I will definitely be back in uh, 2025. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, we're going to have to do boring stuff. No, just kidding. We, we're going to do fun stuff. So, all right. So let's bring uh, my first question to you because that's kind of literally the, the most asked questions I get and you probably get uh, when you talk to uh, customers, right? Um, people just uh, all thought, I guess, or just assume or wrongly think that uh, AI is this magical beast that's just going to solve all their insights and uh, data problems. Is it? Is it magical? Is it just uh, going to solve all my problems just by itself and I can just go back to sleep and maybe uh, we don't need to work anymore? Uh, it's not uh, magical. Uh, I think it probably seems magical. You know, we live in these kind of uh, different realities as human beings. I'm sure when the first Model T showed up to all the horse and carriage drivers, it seemed magical as well. Uh, but we can look back on that and just see this part of technological evolution. Um, you know, when we say AI, it conjures all kinds of feelings, and frankly, emotions in people, because you talk about these dystopian realities where you have Skynet. And, you know, AI is going to take over humans and, and the things that people like Elon Musk say, you know, things we have to guard against, you come against more practical kind of future state, which is how does AI impart bias and other uh, what we call, you know, defects in human beings, uh, racism, things like that into AI models, something we have to guard against. Um, and then you get to really the practical application, which today is a lot of what we call machine learning. When you say AI, it's kind of like saying engine. There are combustion engines and jet engines and lawnmower engines and Tesla engines. You know, there's all these different kinds of things. Um, today, it's mostly about machine learning and it's really about machine learning on structured data. So when you get your credit card alert on your phone, you can thank machine learning for that, which is part of AI. There's no magic in that. That's just math. Um, and, uh, you know, Boston Dynamics robots that can navigate on their own using more generalized AI. That's a good example of AI. And, you know, the way I buy ML and AI is ML is typical on structured data, um, and it really doesn't handle um, unknowns to what it's already seen before well, whereas AI tends to be more adapted at handling unknown events and, and, and handling things it hasn't seen before, so to speak. Um, so AI is very practical and it needs a very specific problem to solve, whether that's navigation or reading documents or uh, alerting anomalous activity on your credit card. And so, John, I don't know if you have, what you want to add to that. No, I mean, yeah, you nailed it, right? And I think that one thing to acknowledge is, you know, we're all a uh, tongue firmly implanted in cheek on the is AI magical. This crowd knows, obviously, it's not. Um, but kind of out in the wild, uh, that is that is unironically a question that people ask. It's something that they feel, right? So I think you need to go into these engagements, not assuming that 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 uh, you know mission owners and and things like that understand the scope of where AI kind of begins and ends, what it's intended to do, right? So you know, like David said, it's extremely if if it's got a specific scope, um, it, it is magic. It's actually magic. Um, you know, by definition, within uh, certain bounds. Um, but it's, you know, ML is just part of a system uh, of problem solving, right? There's ML, there's software. Those are two very distinct things, by the way. And, and I have no doubt we'll touch on that. Um, infrastructure, data, people, uh, you know, the processes, right? It's all a marriage. It all works together to ultimately solve problems. Um, and so, you know, ML is just part of the part of the puzzle, man. Yeah, no, that's that's a good that. So so tell us maybe, you know, you pointed the, the difference right uh, between the two. Maybe you can give us, you know, what would be a good way to describe it to people for them to understand the difference already uh, between the two that we talked about. Yeah, sure. It's a great topic and, and it's fundamental to, I believe, sort of the cultural overhaul that needs to happen. Um, with everybody, uh, you know, federal, commercial, and whatever. It, it, the very first thing to acknowledge is that while it kind of quacks and walks like software, ML is not, right? So um, uh, in traditional software engineering, the input into the creation of software engineering are rules. A business analyst, the, the customers, they are dictating how this thing should act. And then software engineers are just effectuating that, you know, into something executable. With ML, 
the input is actually data. The output are the rules. And so by nature, you can't really predict what rules are going to be generated. There is an entirely different life cycle towards the creation of ML as opposed to software of the maintenance of ML. Um, and I think that the sooner that everybody can understand the difference between the two and really appreciate that you have to treat them as their own two kind of sovereign methodologies, the better uptake you'll see of ML like in an enterprise setting. Interesting. So may maybe, you know, for, for the audience, you could give them two examples where you would use AI versus ML. So people that could resonate with people. Yeah, sure. Uh, two, two times. So uh, let's go with uh, document processing, right? So if you take a look at 200 page documents, um, which as it happens, um, a lot of big organizations and federal agencies and whatnot just have decades of documents that they've aggregated through the years that are just kind of sitting there rotting. Like if I can be uh, kind of, <laughs> if yeah, I can no, be a little that's... provocative, right? And that is and that's because, you know, humans have a way of, of understanding and navigating forms. So when you go to fill out a form, it is likely has some constructs that you've never seen before in your life, but the nature of your intelligence allows you to know that, hey, this box that has first name in it, I should put my first name in there. And these columns are aligned in such a way. And oh, this schedule is referring to an earlier piece. You cannot write rules to possibly go extract and correlate all of the information from that, all of the permutations of how uh, just how uh, electronic information is relayed is is untenable for a human. And so AI can be trained to go pull all that together in, in seconds um, and, and sort of bring those questions to life. Or, or I'm sorry, I was reading a question and said the word question and, and bring like the data, <laughs> those objects and things that are that are within the uh, document to life. So that's one. Um, another one. I'll, I'll, so that would be kind of a supervised version, right, where you're training on historical data. There are uh, things you can do with unsupervised data where there is no training data. Um, where you want to take a look at a corpus of, say, of objects that say you care about. Maybe that's people, places, things, things like that, right? And you want to create a, a meaning to all of those objects, right? So the, the meaning is, um, is derived by AI, by ML, and that can, you know, when, when I see the word Nick, are we talking about you, Nick? Are we talking about a network interface card? And so the context around that can only be ascertained by, um, you know, the ML AI type solutions. Does that make sense? I see. That's, okay. a, that's, a, good, that's a good way to think about it. Um, so, so now that we know, I guess, it's, it's not magical, right? Um, when, you, when you think of the AI engagements you, you've, you've been having and, and you're going to have in the future, what do you think are the right um, pieces or, or thoughts or and, you know any, anything that's necessary for your engagements to be successful? Yeah, so I think you know first of all, I and mean, I know if my audio is better now. A little um, bit. Let's, but, let's try it. Yeah. So uh, bandwidth uh, issue. We need to get AI to solve that. Um, so uh, <laughs> in federal. Uh, I think what's most important just to just to kick it off is culture. And, uh, you know, you kind of move uh, along this paradigm of, of hardcore skepticism of AI and all things related to AI to uh, mindsets that uh, want to examine the art of the possible. And the latter leads to more successful um, engagements with AI and ML. When people are open minded, uh, they're willing to hear some constructive criticism about data readiness, about uh, security postures, about uh, architecture, things like that. That open mindedness really uh, uh, complements and, and helps uh, AI ML engagements go better. Um, also, having a very specific kind of desired outcome or uh, understanding what where they specifically want to apply AI ML. Um, and then I, th I think the second big thing is contracting readiness. So having um, either 
uh, in-house or, or at, at, at arm's length contracting uh, officials who understand how to procure AI and ML solutions and what the implications are for things like uh, data rights and, um, uh, you know, the ability to make government data proprietary data of the company coming in, which shouldn't happen, those kinds of things. So it's really about culture, open-mindedness, and, and making sure that your contracting office is equipped to uh, protect the government when you have an AI ML company coming in to help you, I think. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, your audio is not much better, but um, I sent you a little message on the private chat, maybe to solve it. But um, I, I'm going to ask you follow-up questions, but I'm going to go to John, so maybe we can fix your audio and then can come back to you, because it's just very tough to understand what you're saying. Uh, all right, so John, when you when you look at, you know, the, the same uh, question, right, what what you know? So we we talked about acquisition training of the customer of like, you know, data rights. All this applies specifically, particularly to to the government. So we we do right by the taxpayer, right? But but if you look on the on the technical side, what are the things that people show up with, and you're like, that's just not good enough. Yeah, and you know, a lot of that has to do. So you know, there there are several devils in a lot of details here, right? And so there's no kind of blanket statement. Um, that encapsulates all of every nuance ever. So just, you know, the tech dude in me has to say <laughs> yeah. that by law, right? Um, so the, pretty, what's that? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the first thing is data, right? So, you know, the data is, is or lack thereof, depending on what you are trying to do, will kill an AI initiative faster than anything, right? Except maybe culture, ironically, like, you know, <laughs> what David was saying. Um, and right. so th their data is is a little bit different, right? It's, it's you don't view things as, it's not these transactional uh, pieces of things that you want to go dig through. No, it's more like the, the holistic kind of sum total of a data ecosystem, you know, has signals and information and trends that you're wanting to extract from there. So you have to kind of view data as a whole. And that's not the way that some organizations that have kind of operated traditionally, uh, like have their mindset, um, you know, originally, then there's all kinds of infrastructure things, right? Like even you know, in the federal space, sometimes it's not just as simple as flipping on a, an array of GPUs or something like that, as as you would guess. Um, and then then just the whole operationalization of of ML, right? Like actually bringing it, um, actually bringing it to bear and getting it within production, right? It's 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 not a fire and forget missile. It's it's like a living, breathing thing that you have to feed and care. Um, and and serve it in a different way, and we can get into all of that later. But these are some technical deltas that exist between like traditional deployments um, and ML deployments. And then uh, while I have the mic here, real quick, Nick. So you know, I think just to cabbage on to what David was saying about culture, um, you know, people at the end of the day, be it analysts or or uh, you know investigators or whatever, they just want to do their job. Right. That's all they want to do is their job. And while you and I and everybody here kind of, you know, sit here and think about this stuff all day, they don't really care what's behind the scenes making their life better. They don't care what's right. removing pain, just that pain is being removed. Right. So it, I feel like it's so important to speak to those to, to those people, the ultimate users of the technology, understand what their pain is and then communicate with them how these these creations, this intelligence is going to alleviate pain in their daily life. If, does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and it, it's true that, uh, you know, people just look for outcomes and uh, tangible ones and uh, less, uh, less talk, right? Uh, that's kind of the reason why I, I've been so vocal when, uh, when government leaders are not doing what they should be doing, particularly when this impacts lives of the war fighter. So, uh, so yeah. David, I think you swapped your mic, so hopefully you'll be good now. But I wanted to f do a follow-up on this, right, because you talked about acquisition and data rights and, and all that kind of stuff. The other piece also is is tying back to some of what we've seen with those uh, magical uh, black boxes platforms, right? Because um, it's not just the data that goes in, right? It's it's also all the work you do on top of it to turn it into insights, and that that stuff is often you know effectively built to only work on top of uh, uh, that their black box and effectively that that's a massive vendor lock-in, right? And 
So there's there's IP rights there too with, with the output, but also do people even understand that that hey, of course we're we're keeping the rights of the data we already owned, which is kind of the bare minimum of life. What already was supposed they own is it even going to work outside of that construct right so is that a is that a fair point to bring up uh i think so i do think i'm having bandwidth issues i don't know if i'm coming through any clearer yeah your audio is actually perfect now <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's okay good. so that's yeah nice. i mean listen i think that there's issues on both sides this is new tech uh for all intents and purposes in terms of practical application of course ai has been around for a long long time but, you know, Alex in the comments said, you know, everything is in the size and quality of the data set. Well, that, that's partially true, but uh, there's a lot more involved in a successful industry to government AI engagement than just that. At the TSSCI level, we see high quality data sets all around, uh, particularly in unstructured text, where we can uh, really advance the, the insights on those things. But the security provisions of, around those environments and the ability to share that information and those insights uh, can be very problematic. And so, uh, you know, I was going to touch on this a little bit later, but uh, it not only is in the contracting mechanisms, but the, the DOD is full of good intentioned, hardworking people who are trying to advance the state of the art in AI and ML. Um, but they're dealing with rule sets that were essentially built for data in the 1960s. Uh, much like the acquisition infrastructure was built in the 1960s. So the same way that uh, the PPBE gets in the way of innovation and modernization and bringing commercial tech to, uh, to bear in DOD, uh, there's similar issues there around data silos and data sharing and, and making insights available. You know, in the 60s, data silos were seen as protecting. It was a counterintelligence, counterespionage feature uh, whereas today, data silos enable our adversaries, you know. Right. So there's a lot of modernization that, frankly, has to happen in Congress to allow DOD via laws to actually exploit the potential of the state-of-the-art technology that exists today and make sure that we maintain an advantage uh, against our peers and our adversaries. Yeah, and by the way, your audio is perfect. The, the issue now is my connection, so forget about me. Uh, I don't matter. You just you answering. I just asked a stupid question. The the answer is what matters anyway. So that's okay. Uh, and I don't know what's going on with this today. It's just been a disaster with uh, my connection. Anyway, I have fifty of them too, but all of them have a problem. So I don't know what's going on. Is China coming after me? I was just gonna uh, say it's China. Oh, TikTok. You know, TikTok scared of what we're gonna say. Right. So so we talked about kind of the the key pieces, and I you know I obviously agree, right? I think for some teams and it's funny because i just recorded my training and i have a whole segment on um you know uh, data centricity versus you know the old school uh, siloed uh, application centric uh data point of view and, and so i explain you know how to move from you know th that kind of siloed uh, process to to a data centric security with labeling of data and you know having access to a proper lake and, and structure and structure data and all that good stuff. So I, it's, it's a, it's a 15 minutes video. That's why, you know, I, th I think uh, th this kind of stuff needs to get into the, uh, the government uh, ears, because like you said, um, you know, they, they end up making the decisions on contracts and, and if they don't understand, you know, I, I, I was yesterday again in a, in doing a keynote and I had people, you know, ask me questions about uh, contracts and the fact that people are, are trying to bid, um, contracts to do DevSecOps, but the entire uh, contract structure and process is waterfall. So it's a really waterfall, agile fall, you know, water agile fall mindset that doesn't enable uh, agile. And uh, at worst, it's actually bringing all the the cons of, of waterfall and agile into one uh, construct. It's a complete disaster for the taxpayer and for, for the government people and the contractors. And and they had a bunch of contractors saying, you know, we want to do this, right? But the government is the one not enabling us. So I always go back to learning because that's just what it is, right? People um, are learning. Uh, and if they are learning, they go and learn safe and all the, uh, you know, nonsensical, uh, agile, you know, bloated. It's not even agile. I, I don't even want to call it agile. It's, it's, it's just bloated waterfall renamed with agile terms. You know, it's just so, so that's where we need to step up the game. And I've been pretty excited to help DAU do that 
so we can have you know acquisition uh, teams a little bit uh, stronger. So we talked about you know the the kind of the the key benefits, but when you get started right with a customer, let's say I show up. In fact, I have a good I have a good use case for you because I actually want to build it. Okay, so I'm building this learning platform, right? And it's important for people to struggle uh, when they're learning a little bit, right? But not too much, right? They don't want to be stuck, right, for months, right? You want to struggle, but not too much, right? At the same time, uh, we have multiple personas and multiple type of people, and they don't need to know everything. And nothing is more frustrating than having to learn the same stuff when you already know it, and then you, you feel like you're wasting your time, right? When you go to a classroom and you already know 90%, or if you're lost and you don't know any of it and I know you're struggling like nobody else. So the vision would be to have a, some type of AI that will learn where you are, where you want to go, right? So you're here. This is your role. You want to become a CIO, right? In five years, whatever, right? What kind of training and what kind of content that we already have a database of, a massive volume of, of content, what would, should you be you know, watching over the next uh, year to get there, right? And, and the AI will create will create the content. And then if you struggle, it would see that somehow, whether it's, uh, you know, because you're spending too much time on the video or going back and playing the video again or mouse movement, whatever, right? And then, you know, they would tell you, hey, you know, you're struggling here. Maybe you should watch this video first, right? If I'm your customer and I say, hey, this is what I want to build, right? Kind of... Uh, guided learning, creation of, of content on demand based on the persona of the, the user. And then a kind of, uh, hey, you know, I'm getting stuck. I need help, you know, kind of thing. Uh, letting them struggle a little bit, but not too much, right? What do I need to show up as a customer to get started? And I have a bunch so, of money. So the money, money is not a problem, uh, right? Yeah. I don't know about the, the AI enabled content creation or content recommendation engine. I mean, I really feel like there's a basis there in the ad recommendation engines and content recommendation right. engines that you see on places like LinkedIn and Facebook and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Algorithmically, sure. there's probably not, you know, they observe you 24 seven, take all your data, aggregate it from outside Everything. sources and <laughs> learn your interests and then pick your wallet. They so, know even more. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So there's that, that's your solution for that. Um, in terms of step one, I mean, you hit it on the head. Research is step one. And, and what I really say is like demystifying things. You know, what we find it's, it's, almost, it's a little odd, but you could go in and say, hey, I've got a, you know, an Oracle uh, database that I want to set up. And CIOs are like, fine, let's get started. You go in and say, oh, I've got a piece of AI or ML that I want to implement. And it's, it's like a, a smoke bomb has gone off in the room. Uh, you really have to, to demystify and, and kind of take the fear out of AI ML engagements because today they're, they're fairly standardized. I think there is a healthy amount of skepticism that still needs to be applied based on um, some, some companies in industry, frankly, that have taken advantage of the government and have made government data proprietary information, sometimes, you know, kind of hoodwink the government. So there's a healthy amount of skepticism there. Um, but really, it's about doing some research around the basics of machine learning and AI, understanding what the capabilities are, and then coming up with a vision of where you think AI and ML could help in your organization. So a specific problem. Uh, we focus a lot on unstructured text. Um, that's what, what our company does for a living, operationalizing unstructured text, uh, which, you know, a lot of the government and PDFs and documents in various forms is, is based on unstructured text. Um, and then it's about also just understanding the, the difference. John was touching on this earlier between what you need to do to operate, maintain software enterprises, which is kind of a version based system uh, versus uh, what you need to do to operate, and maintain ML based solutions. So ML operations, looking at data drift and model drift and things like that. So there is a cultural change there where new skills and trades are going to come into the culture and what you have today may not be what you need to get you there tomorrow. Yeah, no doubt. So, t John, t tell us a little bit about on yep. the on the more yep. technical side what what you need and so you know, I can tell already if this was the engagement. So this is this is a classic trap. I've done a lot of these. This one's a trap, right? So you were enumerating all of the rules that you were kind of suggesting about what would be indicative of too hard or things like that, right? So the trap is that you're going to be tempted to interject those rules into mm -hmm. the, the module that kind of dictates how and, and what harder or easier looks like. And you're going to actually lose the fidelity of, mm. of 
kind of the machine understood signal, right? And so the real, the first thing I would tell you, so is, I would be tempering with the 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 AI, all the ML stuff. You're going to undercut it, right? And so the the AI and the ML, what you're going to want to do on this one is is instead of thinking what rules do I need to enforce here, it's what behaviors can I capture? Amalgamate mm -hmm. all of those, uh, you know what I mean? And then let the machine optimize. Um, so a, a refresher on mathematics statistics? Oh yeah, That's I can it. do that. You want me to get into statistics here, Nick? Sorry. And so let the machine <laughs> optimize. Don't throw me the comments. Sorry the comments. <laughs> Man, I'll, I can't I'll bring I want to, I want to talk. Uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> so the... Um, let the machine decide. So the, the biggest folly is getting, uh, not just in your, by the way, multi-billion dollar idea. I think you should pursue it wholeheartedly. Um, <laughs> the, I well, think education the biggest, has no Uber, right? We need a Uber of education, right? To transform it because it's that's right. so, that's, it's well, dying well, for our, it. our people yeah. get in touch with your people. Um, so <laughs> you get out of the way of the ML. There is a time and right. a place for humans to be riding on the loop of information, right? Yep. And in rule dictation, given a certain set of data, that's not the place you want the human to be. So that would be sort of the first, uh, maybe the most fundamental uh, kind of aspect I would try to effectuate onto this, um, you know, this that's, particular. That's a very good point, right? The human is is coming with like predefined understanding of things. And quite honestly, sometimes the AI has as comes to conclusion we can't even grasp, right? And so so it's, yeah. it's, it, you don't want to tamper that, right? Well, and, and I think that, you, you know, the other thing is, is generalities don't help anybody. Specificity is so key when we're talking about solutioning for anything. And there's just so many misnomers and opportunities to kind of interdict logic uh, when you talk in mm -hmm. generalities, right? And so like for us, you know, if we bring, so here's a, here's a great example. When you're talking about AI and the analytics part of the stack, bringing pre-trained models to the equation in DoD is often of great concern because they want to understand what data that's been trained on to make sure an adversary hasn't interdicted that data. So if you're bringing a pre-trained model for imagery analysis to detect if there's a T-72 tank in that picture or if that bridge crossing exists, DoD is really concerned about the data that model was trained on, right? If you're doing data operations AI where you're, you're saying, okay, listen, I want to connect my ML to an S3 bucket and I want it to have been pre-trained on SF-86s to be able to extract data from those in an ML-centric kind of way with very high fidelity. I bet and high China has that, right? Well, that's a, that's a different conversation, right? So is, is DoD <laughs> really concerned about the data that your, your pre-trained model was, was used on for an SF-86, a standard form? You know, maybe it's a much less concern, right? Because it's a much right. more benign application. So again, when we talk about generalities of data quality and how was the model trained, specifics matter. And so I've done, I do about 50 uh, partner and, and customer engagements on average a month here at Torch. Wow. And, um, and what I can tell you is that I, I, the, first, the beginning of all those conversations, I am saying it depends, it depends, it depends a lot. <laughs> because we're stuck in generalities, you got to you got to dive down to specifics, be precise. And remove the hyperbole and all that other kind of stuff, and get to the, you know, the real uh, uh, applicable practical application of the solution. And I guess John, you had a you had a good you know uh, thought when it came to me you know creating bias, right? What about the other side of the the idea of you know uh, creating the content to the audience and making sure they're learning what's going to be you know, important for them to know to get where they want to be, right? So, so creating this mass. So, let's say we have five thousand videos, right? They're not gonna watch everything, right? Uh, right now, I'm creating the videos manually, literally going through, watching the stuff, saying, "Oh, it's biased. It's pushing Google stuff. It's pushing Microsoft stuff." And so, I remove a bunch of stuff that's already like out of the window because I find it to be biased, you know, opinionated, whatever, right? So that's kind of a you know very personal decision, but but whatever, right? And then I, I put myself in the shoes of a CFO or CIO or whatever, and it's, oh, they, they should probably, you know, see those, right? Um, the low-hanging low fruits. Uh, but but could we, is it a thing to think of AI to, to do this work? Oh, yeah, absolutely, right? And uh, not, to, <laughs> not to diminish this, but that's actually a very classical 
Right. It's a pretty AI, basic. Right? It's a pretty. Yeah, that's. I that's, thought it was a pretty basic example, right? Right. Right. No, it's a great example. I'm not aiming to go to Mars just yet, right? It's, it's not pretty. Yeah. It's, 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 it's learning stuff. app Mars. It's step right. A, step B. I um, think GPT three right. could handle that. <laughs> uh, right. Yeah, and so you know, I think it's all about establishing what is your connectivity back to the feedback of your users, right? So if right. I were building this ground up, I would say, how do I intend to harvest um, how they feel if their goals were met and things like that, you know, like mm -hmm. ratings, like, um, you know, five stars, how is your sound quality? That's the most classical way. Uh, but there, there are a lot of ways to skin that cat, right? There are engagement mechanisms you can see. Are they sticking with it? Things like that. So the, the first strategy right. you would want to do is how, how am I connecting with my users? How can I elicit their feedback? Um, you know, whether they even know that you're getting their feedback or not. And, and, make that be sort of the trailing indicator of failure and success and have that kind of dictate how the neural network or how the machine learning model or whatever is going to recommend content. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and you know, obviously people would argue, well, you know, the, the real um, data would be, well, are they becoming a CIO in five years, right? Um, obviously, we, we don't want to wait five years to realize that uh, this thing is not working. So, what, what you know, how would you measure success in engagements like this yeah it, uh, so the first thing and this is a bit of a departure from uh maybe your example but like in the commercial or even usually the federal world right whatever the sort of outcome effectuating system is you need to tie into that right so so you have inputs you have outcomes if you can marry all of the systems involved of the data as input and the outcomes that you're trying to measure, you are golden. Then everything else. Would you do is... like quizzes? I mean, maybe like having yep. a quiz. Loving... Yeah, yep. I mean, well, I can tell you on the business end uh, or the mission end of things, it's less customer satisfaction surveys like this quiz and five star thing. And it's more about uh, time, knowledge, advantage, and cost, which we generally achieve mm -hmm. in, our, in our deployments. And so when you talk about things like JADC2, uh, ultimately what you're trying to accomplish in JADC2 is, is kind of two things ultimately. One is um, very high confidence automated decision making. And mm -hmm. two is autonomy. And autonomy with very high confidence automated decision making at its heart, right? Right. And so uh, in a business sense, we often see in our deployments that we see um, total cost of ownership as well as um, uh, speed, um, uh, you know, advances. So uh, we did a, a Forrester did a study on a project we did in DOD uh, They had a payback period in, in the first six months they broke even. And that's because we were able to take a very expensive data feed they had that they were paying for seven of those, collapse it down to one using uh, kind of data operations, machine learning, uh, and mm -hmm. uh, give them a seven to one cost reduction. But we also see things like when you deploy AI ML throughout the tech stack, you often can obsolesce kind of legacy tools and things like that. Um, and then you're speeding up time to, to knowledge. And so you're getting knowledge advantage. So if you're doing things like personnel security clearances or other mm -hmm. things like fraud, where you maybe have a 48 hour window to pay, and if you pay it erroneously, you've got to chase it but what you're chasing mm -hmm. is an Estonian cyber actor. So in those kind of circumstances, this is where AI ML can come in and really provide an advantage over a human-based baseline, which often is just too slow and frankly, error-prone. Um, so you know, that's what you get with AI ML. And w when a customer comes to you, right, with uh, a crazy idea, like I just did, although I, like, I, like you said, my idea is probably not that crazy, but um, I kind of picked Your it up purpose doable. to me. You know? Yeah. Not too crazy, right? I'm a little <laughs> bit reasonable yeah. sometimes. I can't, I can't, I can't, yeah. I can't always be completely crazy, right? People, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna think I'm crazy after that. Um, so when you get started, right, what kind of expectation do you set on on costs, right? What to expect for people? They have an idea, right? People just like every time you go to an AI company, it's 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 uh, it's a million bucks to say hi, right? What what kind of costs are we gonna see for for you know, maybe mine is a little bit more complex than a, an MVP, right? But but if you had to make it more simple, what, what to expect for companies to engage with you guys? 
Yeah, I mean, you talked about the cool problems in DOD, right? So it all depends on the world you live in and what you define as a hard problem. I, I don't think your problem's that hard. We could probably go to OpenAI and GPT-3 or something even less than that and solve that. Um, what's, what's hard today? Um, create full autonomy of a naval ship to make it a fully automated sensor shooter on an algorithmic basis. Yes. That's hard. <laughs> Right? I'm not going to ask you the that cost involves... of that one. Just give me a cost of a, you know, of a, of a normal, you know, not not right. insane. I, I mean, just the you know, ranges, right? What 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 should people budget for, right? Because I, I think people don't have any clue of what the costs are, right? What's reasonable? What I so you, I think that what you have is is you kind of have this future state of potential of AI, which mm -hmm. I would define as Jad C two which is going to be heavy investment for a long time and it's going to cost a lot of money. Very hard problem, right? But if you came to us and said, hey, Dave and John, I've got 200 terabytes of PDF sitting in an S3 bucket that I can't do anything with. And I want to, I want to use it like it's structured data. Well, then what I'm going to tell you is that I can define a break-even analysis payback period for you that you're going to know when you're going to break even on that investment, either through the insights you're going to gain out of that, that, that 200 terabytes or through the obsolescence of tools in your architecture or the reduction of du uh, duplicative data streams, the maintenance of maybe, maybe those S3 buckets are actually seven S3 buckets and they're all duplicated copies of those PDFs, right? How do we right. reduce your compute and store and actually get yep. you to a single source of truth? Maybe how do we go to the authoritative source if your environment allows it and sit there or just off of it and catch data in flight and really use there. cold storage yeah. instead of warm storage, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so why you you didn't give me a number though? <laughs> that's a good. Well, that's a, a, you're gonna get my answer. What are we talking about? Right? If you give me specifics, yeah, I know. So this comes back. To you, you gave me a pretty me specific specifics. example. So so what are we talking about? Half a mil, a mil, ten mil, five mil. Oh, I mean, there's a there's a IML engagements so you can get in the in, in, that we do in the commercial world that that start in the you know the the on an annual basis less than a hundred thousand dollars for for what we would consider from an advanced technology perspective you know uh relatively benign issues that that just have a practical application of ml we also deal with some jad c2 issues that are that are not yeah, so multiple benign, median right stuff. Yeah. yeah so you give me specifics nick i'll give you specifics you give me generalities <laughs> i'm going to give you generalities yeah. and and so when you look at some of the problems do you find that uh uh, you know, particularly when you talk about PDFs and stuff like that, do you find that you're able to reuse the stuff and may, maybe, uh, you know, become less and less expensive over time because of reuse? Absolutely. One of the things that you can do and that we do in every deployment is we stop moving and duplicating data and we operationalize unstructured text, which usually isn't being used in most enterprises. And so because we objectize that data, uh, and we're moving now five kilobyte data objects instead of five gigabyte source files. Um, you create a lot of, you know, for lack of a better term, viscosity in the data ecosystem. You can use uh, one source of truth and serve it to 25 missions who are all now have a single source of truth. It's the highest data quality, highest veracity. They're all on the same page, that kind of thing. Um, so you get a lot of cost advantage, but you also get a lot of information advantage uh, out of deploying ML and AI. And do, do you find that uh, the government usually wants you to, to deploy all this stuff on their enclaves, their clouds, their environments? Always. We, we've not yet to date had a kind of a managed service where it's deployed yeah. in our environment and where we're giving them results. We, we have a, a IL5 uh, IATT that's pending in the IL5 ATO. And so that ATO process whether it's in DOD or FedCiv, really forms the basis of the security for the environment. And we are a security-based, security-minded technology. So we've got a DISA STIG and, uh, you know, that transfers pretty easily. We're about to step up to IL-6 this year uh, on another environment. So those ATO processes that, that DOD and others have in place form the basis of the security for us. Yeah. In fact, you know, but back to that, that point, right? What accelerators do you guys bring to the table to help teams? Yeah, it's, I'm gonna, John will touch on this, you know, technically, but uh, what I would say is what we bring is expertise and more importantly, experience and lesson learned. So as we've moved around DOD and federal civilian and commercial with Fortune 100 companies and things like that, you learn a lot of lessons about what works and what doesn't work. And that's one of the cool things about industry engagement with DOD is you should be bringing in an industry partner 
who's had enough engagements where they're, you're getting the benefit of all those lessons learned. So I'd say that's the, one of the biggest things we bring is that experience of expertise of deploying against this, this broad spectrum of problems. John will talk a little bit about the technical aspects of our accelerators. Yeah, from a tech standpoint, you, you probably uh, remember those aforementioned uh, components of a system, right? The ML, the software, the people, processes, data, and all that. So, you know, out of the box, we have um, software that allows for the real-time marriage of all of those things, right? So a unification of all of the players within um, kind of a, you know, a system ecosystem kind of parity, right? So... So the first thing you do is allow all, all things to play together with Torch. And then the second thing that's, that's you know, a part of virtually everything we do is, um, if you'll allow me to get a little bit technical here. So when you look at the different modalities of data, right? So data can be highly structured in a Postgres database, or it can be in a PDF that's in tabular format um, in an S3 bucket, right? And all of these different data modalities are trying to contribute facts to uh, resolved entities, concepts, things we know, things we want to uh, put to work, right? So, so if, if, if I'm looking at you, Nick, in, in one document, it may tell me your name and your social and a few other things. And then in other documents or other databases, um, you know, it may have different aspects of who you are and what defines, um, you know, you and your behaviors and proclivities and things like that, right? So there's no way a human can go pull all that information out, fuse it, correlate it, um, disambiguate it, all these things um, with any kind of speed or scale, right? And so we have um, all kinds of things. It's where a lot of our patents and IP, uh, you know, reside um, that are able to pull that data from any, any that, that information from any data, any modality, uh, pick out facts, relationships, concepts, and things like that in context, and then um, house all of that aggregated factual information about the people's places, things, or whatever object kind of makes your world go around um, in, in a single place for uh, to create like analytical value. OK, and so, you know, at the end of the day, what I'm saying in a long winded way is you want um, your data not to be viewed as just the values. Right. I don't care about the ASCII text NIC. What I care about is the meaning. Right. And more poignantly, a meaning, the meaning to a computer. Right. So that when we're computing about you, Nick, uh, you know, we need to know uh, everything there is about you and, and with real life data. Um, so we make all of that data have meaning, we aggregate it into one place, and this is all out of the box, right? And, and then you can access those holistic objects um, and, and your data, the machine representations of everything we know about you or anything uh, can be fed into you know, downstream systems, ML models, things like that. Yeah. And I'll say just on a, on a much more kind of uh, uh, simple, simplistic tech approach. So we really embrace DevSecOps, CICD, um, containers. We, we love deploying images in microservices and containers and, you know, vice versa. Um, and uh, we're agnostic to deployment. So we've deployed into AWS GovCloud. We've deployed into Azure. We've deployed it onto a Linux box. Um, service mesh architecture, you know, deploy and orchestration runtime for those microservices, all that kind of stuff. So we're really uh, embracing what I would say the, the kind of uh, state of the art in DOD is today. Um, and we come across people who love to deploy, you know, K8s and enterprise class containers and things like that. So that's that we're like, we're well, you know, we love that. it here. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. that's, great. <laughs> that's the way to do it. Um, so, you know, people are using all these accelerators, right? But if I looked at some of your competitors, that comes at a, at a massive vendor lock-in cost, right? You're accelerating me, but you're also strangling me at the same time. So so what is kind of the, the way you think of this when it comes to your engagements? And, and is there uh, downsides in using some of your existing work if, if I'm going to be uh, locked in for the next 20 years? Yeah, I mean, it's a generality, so I'll give you a generality in return. Um, it, it, it is, we really, uh, you know, our, our founder uh, and co-founders and our, our CEO in particular, 
Um, we really all have a very patriotic bent and we're, we're eyes wide open. I've been a mission guy my whole life and I'm very interested in, in preserving national security and, and, uh, and the advantage that, that the United States has. And I, and I would never work at a company that does anything that would deter from that. So we're eyes wide open on some of the things that other folks in industry are doing that, that uh, either deliberately or inadvertently create vendor lock, do things like we already talked about, make, make taxpayer paid for data, their proprietary information. Um, and I think it's just really important, again, that, that you've got an altruistic uh, uh, vendor, but also somebody on the government side who knows the potential for pitfalls um, implementing systems like this, API-based systems, things where you got the right government purpose rights uh, on the technology, um, you know, not creating uh, situations where vendors can do things that would, uh, uh, you know, create vendor lock. All that is really important, and, and you won't see that in engagements from us. And I'm a big advocate of, like, kind of codifying that into law. And I don't know whether that's a, a legal thing that Congress needs to do or a FAR update or whatever, but we should be taking these lessons learned that are visible to many folks in DOD and codifying that into law to say this will not happen on federal contracts. Uh, and just kind of take okay. a stand against it and make sure it's enforced. Yeah. All right. So let's take a look now uh, that we talked about the accelerators uh, about security, right? Um, so when you look at AI and cybersecurity, there, there are so many pitfalls, right? I've seen use cases where the data was biased and so the AI ended up being biased because it was filtered at the data source in a way that most people wouldn't think about. I have an example here to give to people so it becomes a little bit more uh, tangible. Uh, people were using data from Facebook and filtering uh, with books, right? So they were using books that they knew, uh, you know, Republicans or Democrats were reading and they wanted to have a biased AI. Um, and so they, they picked books that, uh, you know, to you and me, wasn't crying Democrat or Republican, okay? It wasn't It wasn't obvious, but it was, I guess they knew from data that 90% of the people reading the book were, you know, one party or the other. And, th and then they, they filter the data set to only have the people from that, uh, you know, people that read the book and then they use that algorithm to push other content, right? To recommend other content. So obviously the the content was biased. So that's not really a cyber issue. That's kind of a malicious, you know, kind of issue. But it ties back to to the risk of AI. So I love for you guys to talk about both the uh, the cyber aspect of all of this stuff, but also the uh, the safety slash privacy slash whatever you want to call it uh, risk here. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, you know, our big belief is that when you talk about AI, I am, AI ML, you're talking about data. And the data is where that conversation starts. And somebody in the comments said garbage in, gar garbage out. It's it's 100% that. Uh, and that's why when you look at uh, current mission projects going on in DOD, there's actually an army of people staring at the data that are feeding the models because uh, that that is really where the rubber meets the road um, and before you even get into algorithmic performance and things like that. Um, so, again, you know, where we're operating at is, is we don't operate in the, uh, we're not an analytics tool. Uh, that's not what we do. Uh, we are about making data available and making it uh, available in a way that is explainable to the DOD ethical standard that is explainable uh, to refute any type of bias or, or uh, you know, malfeasance that might have taken place. And because our AI is focused on making data available for upstream consumption, um, we have much less challenges with the kind of uh, adversarial interdiction or, or bad data and bias creation, uh, because what we're interested in is data formats and extracting data out of different file types. Um, that kind of thing is where our kind of where we start at. That's where the start of our solution is. So, John, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. And just as a practitioner of AI, the, the human bias thing is the tr is one of the trickiest ones, right? So, like a model that's drifting. Oh, if it's malicious, right? I mean, if it's not an accident, right? If it's if it's done on purpose, right? Absolutely. And so, you know. I think originally folks thought that if you just sort of eliminating, if you just eliminated some of the overt dimensions of data, right, like fields that you can imagine, like gender, race, you can't, you, you shouldn't be modeling based on those values. And that's 100% mm -hmm. true. And then we all quickly learned 
um, that there are some more, uh, there will be the, an emergence of things in, in some more unlikely, unforeseen, sometimes combinations of other seemingly innocuous uh, dimensions, right? And so we've got some mechanisms that are able to monitor that just like you would expect um, and make sure there's no kind of communities emerging around any sort of protected dimensions, things like that. Um, yeah, and but, I think another interesting thing that we do is, is so we map all the data transformations that happen um, as, as we move things through our, our technology. What happens, it, the, what happens if it happens before you even see it? Right. If if the the, the S three bucket they give you or whatever is already post ETL, right? Yeah. You, yeah. you have no. I mean, there's no one can yeah. fix that, right? So if you've that's lost why it's, it's yeah, that's why it's very then, important to stare at that data. Right, and and that's the, part the school, of the, right. So that's part of the ML life cycle, right? That exists within ML and not within software engineering. So knowing that you can't know what predictions it will make before you start training the model. There's a reason that there's a testing phase in between, you know, testing model performance and outcomes before it ever sees prime time, right? Now, where it gets really tricky, Nick, this will be near and dear to your heart, is if what you want to do is run fast and you want to have a, a ML into a CICD pipeline of sorts, right? You're trying to obviously eliminate humans to the extent where it's possible. Um, that's where it gets tricky with MLAI is how do you still go fast? How do you keep iterating, making sure that you're not drifting, that you're not uh, having bias kind of slip its way in or even more, you know, specifically, it's really, it's common to not find bias in the original testing. And then once it, it hits prime time and goes against real data, then it emerges, right? Mm -hmm. How do you yank it out? What's your you know, what's your backup plan when you need to yank it out, but things still need to function, right? So that's, 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 that's kind of where the part about getting to the authoritative source and examining right. the authoritative source comes in. We want to operate on the authoritative source because there's been no data transformations. And if something's being is, generated is the government from the open, authoritative open to source, that? Are they, are uh, they in some cases, that? I mean, most of the time, uh, there's so, always some reticence about touching an authoritative source. I will say <laughs> that, but I will also say that we have uh, programs coming on that are, you know, ACAT1 systems of record where things have to be done. And you're going to have to deal with an authoritative source if you really want to solve the problem and advance the, the state of the art. And uh, in commercial, you see a time where you refuse, where... when you refuse an engagement if you don't have it? No, absolutely not. But something you said earlier was dealing with post ETL. That's not where we operate. We want to operate. We want to obsolesce ETL. We want to operate pre ETL on unstructured right. uh, data before any human has touched it. Obsolesce that entire human based ETL process and use machine learning instead. That is. Does the, that mean that like all the, these tools that do ETL? You're, you're effectively competing against uh, uh, you know all these stacks that do uh, transformation of data. You know more manual. Yeah, I would say thing. I would say that we're obsolescing it in many cases, so particularly <laughs> when nice. you're talking about unstructured like text. That. If you're talking yeah. about unstructured text, we're obsolescing or obviating the need for ETL. And so this yeah. is part of the, the great transformation that, that's going on, right? We want to make more data available. So ultimately what we're trying to do, the big objective here, is you want to be using as much data as is reasonably possible within your environment to give you more context and insights, right, down at the, the end of the, the day. Mm -hmm. And most environments uh, today are, you know, 90% plus of their environment. Think about how many PDFs there are in the federal government like that are not being operationalized in an efficient way, cost effective way to you know, advance the state of the art. So we don't want to deal with ETL. We want to obsolesce that. We want to obviate the need to do that. Uh, cloud is great, but cloud is being used today most often to duplicate and migrate data. Actors coming right. in and going, we're going to solve your problems. First thing we're going to do is do move all your data to the cloud. <laughs> then we're going to duplicate it. Then we're going to do data science on it forever. Right. Like mm -hmm. that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to hit data where it resides, not move that data, create data, intelligent data objects using machine learning, and then operationalize the system using data objects. Um, so so yeah. I usually don't take questions from the public, but there's a question that I relate to that from Alex. He was asking, hey, you know, uh, are you able to effectively have some type of component at the edge to be able to uh, deploy it on, you know, a cheap drone or wh whatever the edge is, right? Where you would effectively pull from that source are you waiting for the customer to to push it to a uh, some central lake first, and then you you do your work? Or are you are you able to go straight straight to the real 
embedded system source? Yeah, so I mean, technically, you know, our system scales depending on the the architecture and the problem, right? So my question back to that person would be, why do you want it on a drone? To do what? Uh, technically, I think we deploy the, the, the idea was to pull, to be able to pull that data from the drone and bring it back, right? Or, or that's or absolutely it... possible. And we yeah. actually, there's a customer in in in, uh, in federal that has a an edge device problem that we're helping solve that with right now. And, you know, it depends on, like you said, edge is contextual. Like, is that a Navy ship with an AWS snowball on it? Or is it right. a drone, a you snow, know, compute yeah. store, compute store mm-hmm. network? Those are the three factors, right? So the answer is yes, right. it's technically feasible to to get that data and work with it and that worked arch- architecture. And how much of, of your stack, uh, you know, depend, you know, relies on, on you know, specific uh, chips uh, versus, you know, embedded system, you know, real-time OS? Have you guys done anything on real time so uh, i mean just writ large the simple answer for the non-technical folks out there is we don't care um we we have a consultative uh kind of solutioning process that deploys on the the architecture and we're agnostic to that um the other thing is is that we're not using any magical unique you know nobody's ever heard of that kind of technology our tech mm-hmm. stack is tech that's in 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 vogue today and and uh, is is easily understandable. John, do you want to add on to that about real time OS and that kind of thing? No, I mean it's yeah that we just we don't have any kind of barriers with that kind of thing, right? If you can run mm. Linux or a containerization, <laughs> you know, right. like we I I, I can genuinely uh, say we've never met an environment that we can't plop it down on right now. We've even gone with, um, you know, uh, what's effectively a virtual thumb drive of binaries and exploded it like a tarball out onto uh, bare metal. Right. So we've gone that far. I think we can do anything in between. Right. And I guess Alex added some context. He said, you know, for the edge, what if we want to do some pre-processing at the edge on the drone before sending it to the data set lake is that yeah, you, you can yeah. and you should and and i could do i could blow out the rest of the time here talking about machine <laughs> representations of discovered objects and things like that in fact it's like what i think about at night um and so <laughs> there is an incredible uh compression without a loss of of intellectual like uh, integrity that can be effectuated, like can be pushed all the way out to the very edge. Um, so not only can you, but you should. I'll just leave it there. So let's go back to cyber a little bit. So we talked about bias. You want to go back to the source, right? Uh, assuming the customer lets you do it. Of course, if they just use a S3 bucket that's already compromised, if, if you are not writing official, right, trying to accredit a model and say, hey, it's safe to use for DoD, if you just have the model and you don't know anything about what data was used to train it, you would never be able to understand the risk of that model, right? Is that your assessment? 100%. So explainability is everything. And this goes back right. to sort of the cultural campaign here, right? Again, people want to do their jobs. They love and have pride in their jobs. And if so, if you come in and are purporting to do some leg of their job and they can't completely understand how and why it's reacting in the way it is, it's, it's a lost cause. Right. And I can kind of, I can go down that rabbit hole as well before I do, David, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? No, I just say that, you know, in federal, we have the we have somewhat of a luxury of dealing uh, almost entirely in the in the holistic sense with customer data and they've spent usually a great deal of time making that sure that that data has been secure uh, since it's been generated and mm. there are many technical you, methodologies you don't think political that, bias you don't think the administration whether it's this one or the next one or the one before you don't think they could sway the direction of the data a little bit. Oh, absolutely. Push agendas, I mean, right? there, there's, there are organizations right now today in, in federal civilian that have data sets that they believe are so prone to misinterpretation uh, by the public that they have congressional authority to actually present that data in the way that they see fit. And they are the only people allowed to release that data to the public. 
Um, yeah. And, you know, it's a very it's a very anomalous kind of uh, situation with this particular organization I'm talking about. So there's there's politics. I think I know everywhere. which one you're talking about. <laughs> That's yeah. a good one. Politics <laughs> everywhere. And, and you know, data is, you know, people often are there's often a position where people don't want to share data. So there's there's a couple of positions. One is, is people have got gigantic amounts of data that they control. Not necessarily there's any bias in it, but they're a little afraid of what the data is going to tell them if they unleash it. They may not want to know, <laughs> they want to know the answer. Data. <laughs> right. Fraud is a great example of that uh, in some cases. Yeah, they don't want to find out the kind of worm, right? H hand in the scent, right? Hoping for the best, right? Yeah. Um, and in other cases, uh, politics can play kind of a pseudo role where people want that information advantage. And so if we're going to combine two data sets, who's actually getting the, you know, it's qui bono who benefits, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so where we're really helping with, with that is, we're actually today connecting disparate databases from from uh, national security organizations that are not in the same organization. And we're connecting them and creating uh, bilateral relations, if you will, uh, of objectized data that allows both of them to great, see great benefit of that and actually share the insights and the knowledge. And it's really cool mm. to see that at the national security level because it tells you good things are happening, right? The good things are happening with the right people in the right places. So, so listening to you guys right ai is effectively a a massive risk for for authorizing officials to to accredit um it's also something they don't know much about uh, so i'm gonna have like two questions right the, the first one is um you know when you look at the the political stage and how divisive you know the the country is right now and you know people fighting left and right and most likely not finding a middle ground anymore unfortunately you know we're at a very big risk of, of, you know, any administration pushing their agendas. What kind of tools do we have in AI to prevent that? Assuming you, you go back to the, I, I guess if, if you go back to the data source, right, then you would know. But if, if you don't, and it's not mandated to do that, then you're really you have no way of knowing, right? That that someone already filtered, like my book example, right? Filtering down to people reading a book. Then even if you knew about the book, by the way, you would tell me that's just a book. I don't, I don't see bias there. Um, at least not political bias because it's not a political book, you know. So, so what what could do could we do to prevent that kind of stuff? Other than yeah. mandating people need to go back to the source, I guess. I just want to go back to something you said, where you said AI is massive risk to accredit. Totally disagree with that statement. AI is, is being accredited to, to today with our AI in mission organizations in DOD, and it is extremely low risk. So AI is not massive risk to accredit. AI is anything else that is code, right? Right. It's code. But code. we can't we can explain the code though, right? That's we absolutely that's big difference, can. Right? We can we can explain we can explain the code, and particularly when you again get specifics matter here, right? So I can't talk specifically about the mission we're working, but the mission we're working, the specifics of that make it very very uh, highly explainable and highly understandable. Mm. So this is one of the generalizations that really skews people off from when we just generalize and say AI is massive risk to a credit. That is not true. When we talk mm -hmm. about the specifics of situations, AI is being accredited all over DOD today, and it's being done in very responsible, non-political ways by, by good actors in our national security establishment. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, is to answer your question is, remember that statistics class that you took in college where they showed the same poll and they showed like seven different versions of it, like visualizations of it, depending on who the political party was, uh, ex explaining the the results. I didn't go to college, poll. but I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Well, it's it's that it's like standard error, you know, standard uh, you know deviation or standard error of margin, those kinds of things. This explainability right. of statistics, understanding mm -hmm. polling methodology, understanding how statistics are visualized, what those horizontal and vertical. Uh, markers are and what the story is somebody's trying to tell is often more important than any technical thing. So understanding motivation is the first place to look about, you know, when you see uh, visualizations of ML derived information or ML exploited information. And does it, you know, betray logic? Does there seem to be an agenda? All those kinds of things, which are really kind of, uh, you know, cognitive features of humans uh, to detect falsehoods are a great starting point. 
Obviously, there are situations where things are moving too fast and, and that kind of thing. But that statistics analogy, that statistics college class where you, where you saw those visualizations from the same poll that all told a different story, that there's a similar dynamic there if you're looking at political influenced uh, applications of ML and AI. Interesting. And John, so I, I guess I, for me, I, for some reason, I was still um, assuming that that for for an authorizing official, you know, that gets access to just uh, pretty much very little insight on how the the model and the AI was created. Uh, you know, when I look at how we I created software today, I would already argue that that we do it in a very uh, poor way of understanding the actual risk. You know, we we check boxes, but uh, I'm not so sure we we actually understand the risk. I would I would argue that it's compounded when it comes to AI because no one can, no one in the government can explain it to the AO. Um, but I guess I might be wrong. So, so tell us a little bit about how if you are an AO right and you have the responsibility to accredit something on the TSSCI fabric, what do you want to see to know if it's something you would be able to accredit or not? Yeah, so the first thing, I mean, it, it all comes back to the design of your AI system, right? So if you have the option to make a gigantic monolithic um, model that is that, that aims to accomplish every and, and determine every single path, every permutation of data and every aspect of the decision in one gigantic hidden monolith, you're done. Okay, that's the wrong way to do it. So when you break down those atomic tasks that need to occur, um, you know, in some kind of process, and then make all of your ML um, very specific to each one of those legs of the architecture, right? Because the, the best weapon against un, like unexplainability, I'll just invent words, um, the, the best weapon against um, confusion is to have highly defined business purposes for every aspect of what you're building, right? Do not let it, um, every step of get obfuscated into a giant model. And so we have found, and one thing that our platform really um, kind of just natively pushes is the combinatorial analysis of multiple expert systems running in a series or in parallel. And so if I'm the AO, you know, like I guess a, a, an example would be if, if let's say I wanted to build a robot and, and I just want to push a button and it's going to get me a diamond. Okay. So if it just comes back at the end of the day and drops a handful of diamonds in my hand, I'm going to be a little bit nervous about that. By the way, I'm making this up. Uh, so bear with me here. <laughs> Um, I like the diamond piece, so right. But if 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 the robot showed me that step one was to do a, an ML algorithm that was trained on satellite imagery X that looks at topography information, some geologist is on here and is going to skewer me for this. And then step two is to assess the rivers and what kind of trajectories they've taken over years and yada yada yada. You're going to feel pretty confident. It didn't just go mug somebody. But how right. does that how does that happen, right? The I guess maybe maybe your platform is able to take some AI model in a container and explain it back as to humans. Is that how this works? Because yeah, we, I mean, would, it, 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 just to I move out of the analogies. Right? Yeah, to move out <laughs> of the analogies and the generalization. So when we deploy uh, models, we actually have an audit tool that allows you to look from the origin of the data all mm. the way up to the analytic outcome and actually audit the data transformations all the way back to the source of data. So that's one function, right, uh, of explainability. Another uh, function of explainability is some of the more kind of obtuse data data pipeline and, and uh, you know, model monitoring where you're looking for data drift and model drift and things like that that we also do. All these kind of best practices around making sure that AI models are delivering the outcomes they're supposed to be and they're not drifting off in one direction or another because of some bad data operation that's going on. And and, and do, do, you, do, you th do you see every AI model platforms out there or every, you know, open source AI model bits you can pull from the internet able to do that ex explainability thing back to I, I don't think so i don't think so because today 14 year olds can build ml models in their garage 
So mm -hmm. uh, it really depends on consequence. And generally where you see much more scrutiny on data and, and models is where there's governance, there's regulatory requirements for it or, or ethical requirements for it, like in DOD, um, or insurance requirements or some other kind of consequence aspect there. So it, it generally depends on regulatory environment and consequence of if you get it wrong, right? In less governed environments where you may have the bad actors you were talking about before, obviously they don't have that kind of scrutiny in their, their model uh, ecosystem, data ecosystem. And do, do you see... The, the government actively asking for that explainability stuff? Or uh, they... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I met with a, I met, I was Most in the customers last week. Or, or is it like the majority of the, the customers or just all, the exception? All of the ones that we deal with that, that comes up. And I was, I actually sat in a principal assistant at Deputy Secretary of Defense's office last week. And that was the very first question on his agenda. So uh, it, it is at all levels and all, all you know, kind of depths of, of federal. I'm they surprised make that, sure. that they would even, I mean, like you said, they don't even think of IP rights, but yet they, they're thinking about explainability. That, that's, I find that to be well, You know what, they're, they're, it's, it's less that they start the conversation with explainability. It's more they start the conversation with how do, you, how do I know that you're going to get it right? Right. So they're not that, using uh, the right terms, but they understand right. the problem. Exactly. But they're not showing up in the contract saying we need explainability and we need this and it has to be baked in the platform. So it's not that advanced. I, well, I, well right. I have actually that in some cases they are. So hmm. it depends on, wow. you know, if you have a chief architect who's really spun up on AI, you will see that in, in the contract um, hmm. under, you know, for performance criteria. Other places it's implicit or what we also see is that, so, so we have one contract, for example, where we're, even though we may be involved in the algorithmic exercise, the monitoring of data, data pipelines, and model drift is actually done by somebody else. So there's mm. a semi-adversarial aspect there where they're saying, and we're not going to trust one party to do everything. Interesting. Interesting. Well, uh, that's the, I've learned, I agree, I don't learn much on my show. No, just kidding. I do learn a lot from the guests, but this one I've learned particularly more than usual. So that's good. Uh, all right, so we talked cyber. So, so you you actually argue, but but do you argue it based on your platform use that you know accrediting models is not you know much uh, dangerous to the to the government? But did, would you agree just pulling bits from from open source models and things, or is it, is it specifically because of the mitigation that you have in your platform? Yeah, it depends. I mean, like, are we talking about accrediting software for an ATO? Or are we talking about validating it for a mission from a bias or explainability perspective? Like, those yeah, are first different the ATO, types. I would say. Yeah, so the ATO is, is you know, when, we, when you do a disastig and you do an ATO for a DOD agency, um, you're following that agency's process. And that's the security accreditation, the, the process. Yeah, but that they, they have no through. process for AI. There's, there's, that doesn't exist. There's no accreditation process for AI. Yeah, no so problem. they're accrediting code and they're accrediting the right. vulnerability aspects of the system, right? Yeah. From a cyber perspective, you're talking about what the AI with, does. So when you talk they about accrediting, no they can AI. scan it all day long, right? It's, it's just, they're not going to know if, if there's malicious stuff in there, what the AI does just by scanning it with some static code ISIS tool, right? So it's just, you know, that's my issue, right? We don't have a process to accredit. That's the bias models. and explainability aspect. And there is a process. So this is not, this is not. I mean, it's not codified you know, so, in DoD policy. You know, that's what I mean. I'm not saying oh, there's yeah. no ability to do it. It's just not a, it's not a DoD CIO stamp standard explained yeah. process. I think I'm hoping to see that at a CDAO. I mean, I'm hoping. Have you, have you thought of, of engaging with those guys at, uh, you know, Ms. McCann office to, to kind of write it? Of course. Um, and, and maybe we are. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> but we do we do all kinds of congressional engagement. I mean, this this year, I think, you know, I, I personally had over a dozen congressional engagements this year to talk about AI yeah. because I believe that's where that's where the epicenter of all this is. We have to educate Congress and we have to get Congress to codify things both in acquisition reform and in AI enablement that are going to allow the people in DOD to actually execute their mission and do their job. Mm -hmm. And then DOD has got to turn that into rulemaking that's going to allow them to define kind of DOD standards around some of this stuff that's enforceable across DOD and the services. 
I don't know if you're just working with the best duty customers ever or if we're in two different parallel universe because I, you know, I spent a long time in DoD and, and the maturity and the understanding I've seen in AI, even with teams like Jake, were not that impressive. So I'm just a little bit like, I don't know if you're just being very nice right, listen, to people. I'm not being nice, know. but I'm not here to air out dirty laundry. Like <laughs> anybody who's perfect, raise their right hand. Like, you know, it's like that perfection does <laughs> So, of course, there's problems. But it, listen, if you're an industry and you're not here to help DOD solve problems, then go away. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, if you it. want it easy, you know, go away. Yeah. All right. So, in fact, tell us a little bit about the kind of engagements you're seeing in DOD right now. So, we do a lot of uh, entity resolution. We have something we call the whole person model. So, taking a large data ecosystem, maybe with data sources outside of your uh, environment and being able to resolve that at high confidence around an individual. So whether that is for, let's say, uh, personnel security, whether that's for an entity like a company to understand what that company's uh, kind of origin and participants are, um, things like, uh, you know, uh, health records for individuals, aggregating all of that data to help with, uh, you know, clinical predictions and outcomes. Um, other things like uh, mission environments where you have to know commander or somebody uh, has to know, you know, in near real time uh, whether something uh, can be executed and affect something like that. So that would be like a JADC2 kind of ABMS overmatch uh, type of thing. Um, force readiness, looking at uh, readiness data and, and making sure that people understand where all the people and things and state of readiness is uh, from all the data uh, enterprises that are available. Um, all those kinds of things are places where, where we are helping today and we can help. Um, and there's a lot of upside advantage still remaining there. Uh, we also work a lot to kind of automate and speed up human processes, things that are human-based that ML's got a bigger advantage in helping with. Would you say most of your engagements are on the, the business side of DoD or the weapon side? Today, we're mostly on the what I would call the mission side of DOD. And so mission doesn't necessarily mean we don't we don't do anything right. that involves shooting anything. Let me put it that way. Right. Uh, but we so are not involved so much in the weapon, but like the enablement on the, the enablement of the mission side. But now, not, not I mean, without going to shooting, you could you could you could go to, uh, you know, looking at satellite imagery and detecting objects and helping make in, you know decisions whether or so not to shoot and then the shooting is done elsewhere right we don't do that we we do, we like to deal our main uh, our kind of bullseye is unstructured text whether that unstructured text right. is in an audio file a, an image uh, a document that's kind of where we focus and then what can you do with that and i would say that Everything we do today is benign uh, from, a, you know, causing effects on an adversary, but it's it's mission focused. That's probably about as much as I can say there. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, what why uh, what's the limitation, I guess, on on focusing on on text versus imagery, for example? What what's the uh, the complexity? Uh, I just we we our kind of thesis is, is that there's a lot of people out there focused on computer vision right now and handling right. those it's problems. Right, business. It's a business. Yeah, exactly. It's not a, tech, it's not a technical decision. Exactly. It's not that we can't okay. do it. We, and we actually do employ some CV models. So we'll employ bespoke CNNs and computer vision models when it's to our advantage in an ML system that we're building. We've done that before, but it's not a central uh, kind of effort. But you mentioned us. audio, right? Didn't you mention audio just now? So you can pull the, the, the text to speech or the speech to text and, and then yep. use the text. Or stuff like that that's still yeah stuff that so we have patented methodologies that rip text out of audio uh imagery is that just uh, video and audio or video or is it just audio? video audio video images documents teams messages unstructured message traffic anything where that text exists we can grab it and get it any think anywhere where sequences of words <laughs> may like come into existence right yeah. that's you know we we aim to get uh as much information as possible out of any sequence of words um in any kind of format so yeah audio is kind of a treasure trove honestly i see interesting um so next i wanted to talk to you a little bit about you know those engagements when you look at their approach what would you if you were in the government for a minute right inside on the inside what would you improve from an approach standpoint. John, you want to take that? 
Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, federal the federal space has a couple of interesting challenges that don't really exist within the commercial realm, right? Like, so for instance, a, a lot of the data that you'll want to train your models on are sensitive, like obviously, right? And so how do you prepare an enclave for training and frankly, data science where those things can exist and not, you know, and not um, not create any kind of undue cyber, um, mal, you know, any kind of cyber risk, right? So, you know, kind of, I think that I've, I'm just now seeing a lot of stakeholders kind of come up to speed on that reality as they learn the nature of training and how you need a training environment um, for ML specifically and things like that. I'm starting to see um, that kind of infrastructure be laid into place, right? Um, and then, you know, another thing, you know, I think just, I, Nick, I imagine you'll probably have some resonance with this, but, um, it's all ML contributions, just like everything else need to be, um, pertinent to the joint domain, right? Like to ev everybody should be, uh, you know, contributing to the greater DOD good, so to speak. And so data needs to be able to kind of cross party lines. So does intelligence, right? Um, so the way that you kind of, um, the way that you encapsulate these uh, kind of mini intelligences and how you democratize those, make them uh, transparent, um, you know, that's what I think the DOD needs to keep focus on and keep marching towards. Yeah, and I would just add to that, like, one of my favorite quotes is, if you care about the goal, you'll focus on the system. And so I'm really encouraged by, uh, you know, things like JADC2 and CDAO, which are definitely forcing functions for the rest of the organization. And it's interesting to watch the struggle uh, with Congress, with funding, with acquisition reform, you know, all of this, but it's all evolution. And you look at, you know, Jake and, and uh, Defense Digital Service. I know there's pros and cons on, on both of those organizations. Again, nobody was perfect, but at least somebody was making an effort to do something. And so that's what I'm continuing to look for is, is uh, making sure that that effort at the top is there and hoping we get the congressional response to support it, you know, that can really change the paradigm. Yeah, Greg is going to do a lot of great stuff. So I'm excited about it, no doubt. <laughs> Um, yeah. I mean, what other country does the does a does a, a gentleman like him leave an organization like that to come serve in government and and give up what what he probably gave up? I mean, and same thing for you, and same thing for everybody else that that has you know a lot of different choices they can make in life, but instead they choose to serve. That's that's one of the things I love about about us, you know. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure China has it too, but it's not willingful. You know? <laughs> so not the same, yeah. <laughs> they get yeah, the people, it's, it's but like I'm not sure they're very excited the about it. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So we talked a little bit about the AI black boxes, right? But but if you have to summarize what uh, language you would want to see inside of contracts while waiting for Congress to wake up and figure out how to start using their smartphone, uh, how does this how does this work? What 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 kind of main things, main themes or clauses would you want to see in a contract? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's it's all about there's got to be clear prohibitions on making government data, uh, company proprietary data. You know, that can never be allowed to happen. And yeah. other things just, just revolve around kind even, of government. Even when it's augmented, um, right? So, so, so if someone takes – let me give you an example, right? Someone takes – uh, public data, right? Like satellite imagery that somehow is public for some weird reason. And then you augment it and you detect tanks and whatever else on top. Would you think it's fair for the company to own the augmentation piece on top of that data since they built the IP to detect objects on top? Like what's the limitation of that clause, I guess? I think the limitation comes down to what's the government paying for? Uh, and right. What's the what if they're not paying, paying the company? So, so, so what if they're using public data, but the, the company is not paid by the government? I don't know. It's a, it's an esoteric question that I think is interesting, but I think it's, it's simple and it's solution in that uh, if it's public data, then I'm not concerned about it. If it's right. government data, 
if it's that government the data, meaning meaning right. us, we have paid for, for that data. That cannot become company proprietary. No, but you know, data. a good example is as a, as a government employee, if I code, right, the, my source code, I don't have any kind of copyright, so it's public data. So we can classify it, but that's different. It's you know, by default, people don't understand this in the government, but it's still public data. Uh, there is no copyright protection that I have as a developer, right, of that code. Um, so then that would mean, unless it's classified or CUI or secret or top secret, right, it's, it's public. Uh, would someone be able to take that and augment it or tweak it or, you know, that's always an interesting thing. So I'm just trying to see where you stand and where, where what's the right. So, so you're yeah. saying if it's, if it's a contract, then, you know, the, the output of the contract, if it was paid for by the government, what com- comes out of it should be owned by the government. I, you know, I don't think I personally have a position on that. I think from a company perspective and a per- personal perspective, we're pretty uh, centralized on government data cannot be made company proprietary data. Government's got to have mm-hmm. some rights that are reasonable. And I think there's some reform mm-hmm. that can happen in that area where, uh, you know, companies can bring patented uh, methods and, and code to a situation and deliver outcomes for the government in a way that works for both parties and de-risks for both parties. Um, and, you know, those things need to happen as part of acquisition reform and as part of the, you know, the, the continued advanced technology evolution uh, inside of DOD. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that, that's just our, you can't have vendor lock. You can't have a situation where somebody owns a solution with the government, even though there's, there's competitive, you know, commercial solutions that can be done cheaper, faster and better. And there's no way for the government to ever get out of it. You know, those kinds of things just can't happen. That's not good for the country. And it's not part of, of uh, you know, what a DOD industry contractor should be bringing to the table. Right. What, what else are you worried about when it comes to, you know, contracts? What, what should people ask for? Is there anything else? I think that, you know, again, what about that, that scale- concept of, uh, you know, we talked about the security and the uh, uh, explainability stuff. Should that be should that be required? I think depending on consequence, yeah, and regulatory environment, yeah, it should be required. Um, our position, and, and I think John and I's position, is what's best for the nation, right? So when you start, when you preface every question with that, the answers start to get a little easier. It's, a, it's a very subjective answer depending on who you ask, though. But yeah, a lot of people well, think it, they're doing the right thing for the wrong, but you know they, they're wrong, but they still believe in it, you know. Yeah, and that's that's a you know, are we talking about enhancing national security or are we talking about quarterly profit reports? Mm-hmm. You know, those two things don't those two things can coexist. They they're right. they're not adversarial, right? But but overall having a good ability to uh, you know uh, understand the process and and do an audit of the model should be pretty much a must, right? And that's, I think CDAO has got a large role to play there. So in terms of informing, educating, baselining DOD on what's acceptable and what's not contractually, uh, practically from a performance and auditability standpoint, uh, mm-hmm. how do you certify bias and performance of models as well as the code from a security perspective? How do you make it easier to intake innovation, you know? We have a, a project right. that, that potentially may do uh, essentially the ATO by CICDing the stuff into the environment instead of going mm-hmm. through a, a formal ATO process. So those types of innovation and, and looking at, again, the art of the possible, this goes back to the very first thing we talked about, right? Like what's the mindset? Is it open-minded? Is it collaborative? And what's possible? Okay. All right. Um, so now uh, my final question before we talk, you would take a few questions from the, the public. Uh, I had to ask it. I didn't tell you before, but I don't care. Um, is AI sentient and is it is it coming? You know, where, where are we on that? I, you know, I'm, I, I would bet that Google has stuff they don't want to share with the world. And, and, and of course, <laughs> it's a very subjective thing too, right? So I, people have a tough time saying when exactly some, something would be considered sentient. I, I would argue I've seen stuff already at Google that, that – you know, look sent him to me, but what what do you think? So can I take this one first, Curve? Uh, this so, one is for you. I mean, come on. As someone who makes, you know, what I do every day is is learn to understand the very depths of these deep neural networks and the mechanisms that make them run. And 
I don't now, I now don't believe that humans are even sentient. And that's kind of a hot take, <laughs> right? But th there's, there's, yeah. okay, yeah, there we go. We got, it's we like got a monkey. Would you say a monkey is sentient? So if, if, a, if a monkey is sentient, right? There's, so, yeah, I, I, uh, a monkey. Have you seen AI, AI to be as good as monkeys, I guess? <laughs> sure, yeah. Yeah, and again, it's at what, right? So I haven't seen an AI. I haven't seen any uh, algebraic uh, regressors that are as strong as like a gorilla. <laughs> but <laughs> but they're, you know, from reasoning and, you know, sentience being maybe like self-preservation. I think there's, right. you know, I think that, that machines are there and can get there pretty easily. But I would also say, I would sort of posit that it's it's no different than the human condition humans you know there's ultimately experiences and past and training and learning that lead you to behave the way that you do it, they're all just inputs into a system right all of it and it's no different for machines right it's all just mm -hmm. input so like i said but I you, can, do you feel like it's gonna come i mean is it gonna be a thing uh, ai sentence can I just can I just contextualize here for one second? Like sure. yeah. if you if you look at GPT three, which was yeah. I think around fifty billion parameters, that was yeah. only trained on forty three terabytes of data, right? Something like right. that, and and the cost mm -hmm. was exorbitant. Like they come out and said we can't retrain that model because of cost, so they're going to move to GPT four, which is going to be a trillion parameter model, which will probably I don't know what that's going to be two hundred terabytes a day. But when you say when you say that GPT three, one of the most advanced algorithmic entities on the planet was trained on 43 terabytes of data. That is a mm -hmm. drop in the ocean, in the data ocean, right? Yeah, but so, is, it, is it better than most human? It's there, only better on, I mean, I don't know when you say better yeah, what that means. It, again, what is GPT-3? Well, yeah. So it is a thing that given a precursor of tokens is able to uh, predict the probability of the next token. And then once that token exists, what's the probability of the next one? So it's fantastic at token prediction, right? Now that right. manifests itself in a lot of very interesting looking ways. But at the end of the day, that's what it's doing, right? Yeah, Not just away it, from it, it's it, amazing. It, and by the way, humans are terrible at assessing sentience. That's the Turing model. We can't right? define it, so I've yet to hear yeah. the same definition. Yeah, I mean, is it coming? But, yes. But it 10, if you think of it as, as you know, potentially, like you said, the, the fear of of being turned off, right? Like in the Terminator, Terminator movie, taking over a self-preservation, right? Is that a, is, could that be a thing? I think it could absolutely be a thing. It's just that mm -hmm. who's the idiot that's going to <laughs> cook that? Oh, we have a lot of idiots. Don't, don't think know. we don't have a lot of idiots. Yeah. We have a I, lot of I, I mean, we may all be living in a simulation. So, you know, yeah. who knows? Right. I mean, the Matrix is pretty clear. I took the, the red pill. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. About one third of my, uh, my analogies here at work are on the Matrix and what is information and things like that. So I'll, I'll Although I wasn't a big fan of the last matrix. I can tell you, I mean, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't great, but it didn't scratch yeah. the itch, you know, it didn't, it no. wasn't what I needed it to be, but that's okay. No. That's for a different, uh, we have high problem. expectations, right? All right. Yeah. So let's take questions from the public. I still think it's coming. I'm going to say it's coming. I think it is too. It's going to come with honor. We like it because some crazy person is going to do, it. I mean, look, they're, they're cloning, trying to clone humans in China and stuff. I mean, who knows what they're going to do over there? Crazy people. All right, so here we go. There's a question for you guys when it comes to selecting, I guess, Lua as your programming language behind Torch. So someone is trying to tease you or something. I don't know. Uh, we're this is this we hear this one from time to time. So we're not affiliated with PyTorch or that uh, oh. learning library. <laughs> right. right? So, I, I, I wasn't sure if he meant PyTorch or he meant Torch. So yeah, yeah, I guess. that's a common thing. So that's I, yeah. I don't. Jared, you you I pick the name; it's very that. confusing. You know. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, Can't we use a very common programming language, one of, one of the best known widespread programming languages out there uh, as, as Which the, is what? the code for Torch. Well, it's uh, yeah, I mean, we actually, we don't, we use, so I'm a bit of a boomer in that I've been, you know, for years developing in Java, like DL4J, right? Who does that anymore? Yeah. And, and only in like the last couple of years, I've adopted Python, but our Python, internal yeah. CICD methodology, you know, as you would imagine, Nick, dictates that 
the sovereign teams that are creating these intelligences are kind of free to use whatever languages and mechanisms that they want. And then their little mini solutions kind of are self-contained, right? You know what I'm saying? Yep, yep, yep. Nice question. So just to be clear, we, we don't use Lua, so. No, go ahead. <laughs> you don't use, yeah, you don't use Lua. Yeah, it, it's not yeah. PyTorch, right? So you're Torch.ai, yeah. not right. PyTorch. It's just too many people, you like torches, apparently, so. I want to burn yeah. stuff down. All right, so Cameron, who, by the way, is a good example of someone that could potentially destroy the world if you give him too much stuff. So be careful when you give him an answer, okay? Awesome. Uh, so he, he says he sees there's a data product on your website, right, probably. I imagine that uh, it has training uh, data function, and if so, is data returned to the overall data set to increase comprehensiveness of the data service? So like a, kind of exponential self-updating thing. So... Yeah, that is so that first of all, that's a spot on kind of question slash observation, right? So we operate within the data operations lane of machine learning, right? Which means that we want to take all modalities of data from all sources, pull it together, aggregate all the facts and then serve that up and the knowledge within to consumers of that data in a way that they can use, right? So we have an experience API that, you know, allows your Salesforce or your ServiceNow or your bespoke system uh, to consume something in the way native to it. And so I think what I hear you saying is at the end of the day, you've done all this stuff with data. People are trying to get at it, right? At, at kind of the grand data product. Do you stand that up so that that can be consumed as a data service? And the answer is a resounding yes. Did I get that right, right Cameron? Otherwise, your kind of stuff will be useless because it's not iterative yeah, and point. It's right, yeah. right. It's meant so to vacuum, feed stream stuff. Vacuum right. stuff like the government, you know. You don't want to do that. You don't want to be in vacuums, right? Um, there's so many questions, but I'm trying to pick. So Robert, our good friend Bob from uh, DAU, is here. He was asking, um, you came late. He's always late. No, that's not true. Uh, but he's asking what type of learning can you actually do with Torch? Can you do expert system like knowledge or making predictions? I mean, you talk about text and, and all that stuff, but all of the above, I don't know. What's the answer? You yeah, me. all of the above. And so um, so the expert systems, so yes, yeah, so knowledge, we, we trade in the currency of knowledge, right? So put another way, knowledge is data representing with meaning and context. And so when we go and aggregate aspects of the data that we're processing, we're turning it into knowledge, i.e. semantic meaning, right? Now, once you do that, the whole world of analysis is open. And so out of the box, we have like community detection, we have predictive um, analytics and things like that, and and all kinds of different classifications and and interjections and all kinds of things. So I, I, again, I, there's not really um, the way we aggregate data. There's nothing that we can't do once it's in sort of that analytical context rich format. So what I'm hearing is you you're gonna completely be able to build my uh, my training learning thing. I, I've That's got good. you, man. I've got you. No, no. Here Just... we go. So Vincent was asking about, will data evolve to the point, I don't know if it's data or AI, but but I guess AI would evolve to the point that he cares about who is asking the question. Um, Sentient data. <laughs> well, yeah, like no, I... knowing that, you know, if it's me asking or if you asking, it's not the same context, right? Yeah. And it, it, so, it does so... that. Oh, go ahead. What I will say today is this is actually a really interesting question. So governance comes with with our service. And so one of the things we can do we can do is uh, take on, for example, Calibra uh, governance data tagging catalog uh, information. We can also, when we read documents, understand uh, this is a document that is secret, no foreign, or this is a document that is uh, can be shared with NATO partners or Title 50 can see it, but Title 10 can't. So today... We've already created a solution where the data cares who's asking the question, meaning that the data will not make itself visible to somebody without the right authorities to actually see that data. So in a way, we're already there today uh, when we talk about governance of data and data sharing based on user rights and user authorities. If we're talking about, you know, truly, you know, data that is that is self-aware and actually can interrogate who and why somebody wants to ask a question. That's probably John's future 
future brain answer. Yeah, that makes sense. That's good. Okay, so we got that one. Um, I'm trying to look at all the, we have so many questions. Um, okay. Mike is asking, what are the issues relating to the US, US AIML companies working with the Five Eyes partners from a NITAL perspective? So, you know, it would, yeah, it would, I think it falls under ITAR, but it, it also falls on, depending on the specifics again, but there's also, you know, growing national security interest about transferability of trained ML models and AI models and having those those things fall into the hands of adversaries. So uh, it, it is all dependent on the specifics, but obviously our five eyes partners are our closest partners that we have. And I think if there's cooperation, there's public public information out there now, but what we see is great, great cooperation right now between the US and Australia on a number of initiatives. And we're sharing some of the most sensitive technology we have with them, submarine technology. So depending on the partner and the use, uh, exportability is going to be you know, completely defined on the specifics. And, and that's, you know, I think that's the answer on that. All right. Um, I guess there was a comment from Jared talking about um, the fact that on GitHub, maybe it says that you guys are using Lua. So I don't know if that's an old thing or if it's a mistake. Oh, or... um, let me read this. Or yeah, you can, so you I can still think that's the out, Torch. Yeah. Da uh, like uh, data science framework, right? So PyTorch is the oh, it's not PyTorch. Framework. It's a Torch framework. Yeah, so it's not yeah. Torch for AI. Right. Yeah, so, so you yeah, have too many uh, Torch. You, you really need uh, to buy them out. Oh, if it's open source, I don't know. Rename it. That's a great it's, idea. You're confusing people here. I know. I know. I confuse myself. You have PyTorch. You have Torch, the the framework thing. You have Torch AI. Goodness gracious! <laughs> All right, so. Um, here we go. Uh, Rob was also, also, Bob was also asking, uh, do you have heuristic, heuristic, I can't say that word, with your data results level of confidence, depending on what data, what that data represents? Yeah, so every single piece of datum that we, um, that we extract and then aggregate comes with its own, and, and when I say a moat of data, I'm talking about field level, right? So we mm -hmm. re retain the granularity to field level um, kind of findings with an, a complete audit trail of how uh, that, you know, what was engaged dynamically for that insight to come to exist. And then there is a confidence level um, on every single thing. And then, of course, all the lineage and everything. So the idea is, and I'll be quite here in a second, you know, as a data centric uh, data platform, right? E different consumers will have different tolerances to different data sources, confidence levels, maybe even AI, ML, uh, like algorithms that were engaged, right? So you have to retain every bit of granularity so that different consumers can get exactly what they're tolerant to. Here we go. So I, this was the last question, but first I'm very thankful of the two of you taking the time to share with us all this great. I think a lot of people learn a lot. I learned a lot of stuff and I can tell you, um, it's pretty rare. I learned that much. So that's pretty cool. Um, so that's one. Number two, I always give the last words to you guys. So you're going to have to, uh, give, uh, your last uh, final thoughts before that. I wanted to remind everybody to subscribe to the show at uh, in the nick of time TV and the next guest next week, uh, is going to be very interesting from uh, Forge Rock. Uh, uh, Eve is going to be uh, joining us next week, and we'll announce it tomorrow, so stay tuned for that. So next Tuesday, 1 p.m., uh, Eve uh, from Forge Rock will be joining us, and it's going to be a pretty deep dive discussion. Again, pretty technical, too, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, but over to you guys to be able to give us your last uh, pot potting words. You should let me go first, David, since it's you're the more eloquent speaker and you're on mute also, so you lose. Uh, you know, so A, I just appreciate you uh, putting us on here, Nick. Um, I think that this conversation as a topic is necessary. And the more people, you know, I think we're trying to all kind of work together to attain a critical mass in, in kind of, you know, like thinking. 
on AI as it pertains to the federal space or frankly anywhere. And so anytime, um, you know, I'll speak for David and myself, anytime we get a chance to go out and sort of have this conversation, um, I feel really good about it. Like it's a very productive thing to do. So just thanks for having us, uh, you know, look forward to these conversations. I'll geek about it anytime. So anybody on here, reach out anytime and I'm uh, happy to talk about this stuff. So thanks, Nick. Yeah. Uh, same here. Uh, thank you for the opportunity just to, to have a casual conversation with, with no real agenda other than education. Um, I wish we could have more of these uh, as well. I'm really hopeful about AI. I've been involved personally with AI. I uh, did my first kind of mission ML project in national security in 2013. Um, and, uh, we, you know, that was back when we were using SVM support vector machines and things like that to accomplish some mission oriented goals. Um, got to sit on a Harvard uh, AI ethics panel and have been just intellectually interested in AI and ML. I think ML can help humanity a lot. Uh, obviously, we've got to be careful. We've got to um, do things we talked about today, which is measure the outputs and, and make sure that we don't have bias and other bad human things involved. But I really do think that it's, a, it's not only a national security implication, but it's things like health. It's things like generational health. It's things like uh, public uh, service and, and making uh, people's lives better and, and easier uh, in many cases. So I just hope that we uh, come to a point where we fear less about AI and embrace it more as you know, code-based technology, just like any software that can uh, really help us understand our world better and provide insights that, that aren't within the realm of uh, you know, the human brain. So that's it for me. Thanks so much. Well, thanks so much, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, as always, we'll see you next Tuesday. In the meantime, keep pushing, keep innovating, learn fast, fail fast, don't fail twice for the same reason. And let's make sure we win uh, against China so our kids have a fighting chance at winning 20 years from now. Stay tuned uh, next week, 1 p.m. Have a good uh, rest of the week. Bye-bye.